I'm hitting the road to explore the wild beating heart of Tasmania. The Central Highlands. They call this the land of a thousand lakes, and I can see why. I'm Lisa Miller, and my family have always had a soft spot for Tassie. Dad worked in a mine as a 13-year-old, not far from here. But I've never been to this area, so I'm starting my journey at one of Australia's largest freshwater lakes, the Great Lake. While this looks pretty spectacular, it can all change in an instant. The fickle and often brutal weather plays a big role in life up here. Harry, how cold does it get here? It gets bloody cold, <laughs> real cold. You put a tennis ball in the toilet bowl, <laughs> or it'll freeze the water. <laughs> what lurks beneath these golden waters is the draw card. People come from all over the world to fish the wild speckled brown trout. Water is at the centre of everything. Tasmania has been built on the back of its power. High above sea level, people live in hidden shack communities. And for many locals, fishing and hunting are a way of life. Oh, Irene. Oh, who are all these fellas? They are all mine. You shot them all? Yes. Hold on. I want to get to know this fierce place and find out what it takes to be a Central Highlander. My first stop is the old hydro town of Liawini, which is the Aboriginal word for frigid. It has a population of two. Going. Not so good now, I think. I'm Senior Constable Dan Adams from Liawini. Got your licence on you there? Ah, so you're not from around here, Lisa? No. I think you better jump in with me then. You want me to do what? <laughs> Lucky for me, the local copper is not going to throw the book at me. He just wants to show me around. So, this is Liawini. I only saw a couple of houses, are you sure? That's it. It's never been much. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> and so who's there now? Uh, it's just me and an inland fisheries officer. That's a bit intimate. <laughs> <laughs> I was up here by myself for a long time. So uh, that was even more intimate. What's it like living in a town that the name means frigid? It's uh, true to its word, that's for sure. <laughs> and when you look out the window and you see this kind of scenery, what is it that you like about it? I don't know, I don't like it. <laughs> You don't like it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not pretty. It, 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 I think the beauty of it all is it's so harsh up here. <laughs> 150 years ago, this is where the bushrangers used to come to hide out to get away from all the heat that was on them. And if they didn't have a police officer up here, it would go back to those um, ways very quickly. Um, lawlessness, I call it. You got a few people up here escaping the law? Yeah, it's not too bad these what, days. What about yourself? <laughs> Do you fall into that category? I don't fall into the crime side of uh, escaping. <laughs> but I've definitely escaped a few broken marriages. That's why I'm up here. Bush Ranger of love. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dan tells me he was the only one to apply for the job up here. I'm not surprised, but I am wondering what he actually does. Is there much crime up here? No, no. The, the style of work that you do up here is very old school. A lot of it's welfare checks, especially over the winter. I'm checking in on all the shacks that are unoccupied. And, uh, yeah, just saving lives and breaking hearts. <laughs> So, Lisa, this is the typical shack community up here in the Central Highlands, here at Reynolds Neck. Many people live here? No, there'd only be a handful, one or two, here at all times of the year. So are these shack communities dotted all around the lake? Yeah, yeah, this is why people position their shacks here up on the, the foreshore, is uh, to get these lovely million-dollar views in shacks that are worth probably $50,000. Dan gives me some intel. He says I need to head south, beyond the lake, to Patrick Plains, to meet a woman he reckons is one of the last true blue Highlanders. Irene Glover's family have been in the area for five generations. She and her husband run this sheep property called Waiharija. They're the last full-time farmers in the Highlands. So you're still using horses to run the stock on the property? Um, yes, we've always used horses. Much easier on the bush, much easier on the stock. And this is a beautiful horse. Yeah. What kind of horse is this? They're Welsh cob. Go back 100 years. Dad had them back in his early days. I wouldn't trade him for anything, not for a Mercedes-Benz or whatever, no. I just love the horses. Irene is from a big family. She's one of 11 kids and grew up on a property just down the road. In the early days, she didn't have very much. Like, money was pretty scarce and there was no luxury stuff. We slept four in a bed, two up and two down, and we only had boxes to sit on. And Dad worked as a shepherd. <laughs> A big part of the history of this place is wrapped up with the shepherds who roamed these parts since the early 1800s. When the feed ran out in the lowlands, farmers hired shepherds to run the sheep up here to the central highlands. They'd live in shacks for months on end, tending the sheep and later hunting and trapping rabbits to survive. In the early days, she had all the shepherds, like 60 or 70 shepherds, and droving their stock and all living around the bush, and that was very special. And it's something that's gone now and, and will never come back. Shepherding may be a thing of the past, but hunting is very much a part of the present. Oh, Irene. <gasps> Who are all these fellas? They are all mine. You shot them all? Yes. Hold on. Hundreds of wild deer running rampant on Irene's property has led to culling. How many have you got? Mm, there's probably 15, 16. And then there's some more up in the shed that I haven't had mounted yet. Wow. Yeah. Hunting's been a big part of your life, it? Hasn't has, it has, a whole part of my life, yeah. You enjoy so, it? I love it. It's being outside, being with the dogs and the horses and early morning and late night deer shooting is just absolutely beautiful. While Irene may be an avid hunter of the destructive wild deer on her land, it doesn't mean she can't have a soft spot for a very special herd which she breeds in her backyard. We've got some semi-wild deer and they're all white and oh, they're very special. I love them. Yeah, I just love him. Yeah, you hold him. Oh. Oh. He's beautiful, isn't he? Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. And they're so soft, aren't they? And he's got all these little speckles all over him. One more resident of the Central yeah. Highlands. That's it. What are we going to call it then? <gasps> Backroads. Backroads. We'll call it Backroads. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Backroads. Oh. 
Not far from Irene's place, on the shores of the Great Lake, sits Maina. It's the largest town on the lake, but it seems a bit quiet. That's because around 90% of these shacks are empty. However, there are signs of life. Hey, Carrie, what's that on the back? The barrel? Yeah. That's the petrol tank. The petrol tank? Yeah, that's got a stainless steel tank inside. It looks like a wine barrel. It is. Harry Castles owns one of the oldest street rods in Tassie. It's a love affair that started over 50 years ago when he bought the 1923 Model T Ford for $80. You go? <laughs> no, it's great fun. Yeah, I still enjoy it and, uh, yeah, it gets the adrenaline running, you know, because it goes pretty quick. Later on at Harry's place in Maina, I just have to ask the question. When was your last haircut? Oh, I haven't paid for an haircut in 69 years. That's a <laughs> fact, yeah. <laughs> when did you first come up here? With my father and grandfather as a six-year-old, yeah. One of my father's friends had a shack here. What were the shacks like back then? Primitive, all outside toilets, no power. Lanterns, caro lanterns, just tank water. How did it start, the communities up here? Fishing. Totally fishing, even more so than shooting. People come up, fishing was good, so then they decided to build themselves some little shacks about the place, you know. There was no leasing of the land or anything, it was just there. Are there still some of the old shacks around? A few, yeah, up along the lake there is. Uh, not very many. They're all getting renewed now. So there's not a shack or a block of ground hardly for sale here now. It's all been bought up. Harry tells me that many of these newcomers don't stay. I wonder if it's got anything to do with the brutal winters. Harry, how cold does it get around here? It gets bloody cold, <laughs> real cold. <laughs> During the winter, some days it's impossible to work. It's just too cold, you know, uh, everything's frozen. How do you live with that? You adapt. You put a tennis ball in the toilet bowl. Uh, I've had it boil, uh, freeze the water in my kettle, put Vaseline or whatever turns you on on the rubbers of your car. <laughs> Don't you leave your handbrake on. When the wilderness turns wintry white, Harry retreats indoors to carve sculptures out of hue and pine and make cane rods for fly fishing. What's the appeal of fly fishing? The hunt, full stop. Is it addictive? Very, yeah, that's why I'm here. What kind of fish do you get around here? Brown trout, canning, that's my favourite fish. How long does it take to master the art of being a fly fisherman? A lifetime, definitely a lifetime. That's probably the thing that pulls you into it more is it's just a, a bit like music or anything, it's just a never ending journey. Harry's been on the hunt for 63 years, and he's not the only one. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and Beatle George Harrison have also tried their luck. Now it's my turn. So the idea, just pick it up gently. Don't go back too far over your shoulder and just place it down. That's the art of, of being able to cast properly. Uh, do you want to try that? Thanks. I'll just duck, right? <laughs> Don't take any notice of me. <laughs> yeah, you took it back a bit far, but it's still good, yeah. Yep. Is this one of your special spots? This lake is. This is one of my favourite lakes, yeah. 
This lake, Little Pine Lagoon, is recognised as one of the best dry fly fishing lakes in the world. How's that action? Nice. <laughs> Why do you love this, Harry? You know, I just like the, the challenge. All I've got to think about is uh, trying to catch a fish. I don't have to think about a man trying to chase me or girls trying to chase me, you know? It's, it goes all blank. <laughs> And could you come out here and not get anything on a day, uh, or is that rare? No, that's the norm. Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> so I cast and cast and then do a bit more casting. And then suddenly... Oh, you've got a weed. I've got a weed. <laughs> yeah. Got my hopes up. After a disappointing start to my angling career, I head north to the Central Plateau Conservation Area. It's part of the Tasmanian World Heritage Wilderness and is littered with glacial lakes and ancient alpine plants. The plateau, which sits over a kilometre above sea level, made it the perfect place for the beginnings of hydro in Australia. Watamana was the first large hydroelectric power station to be built in Tasmania. It was the dream of a bunch of visionaries, including a sheep farmer, to bring power to the entire state. So, Gwen, what's the significance of this place? Well, Watamana, it was the first place in the Southern Hemisphere to generate power for commercial, industrial and domestic use. And it was a totally new to concept to the state and brought so much industry here and really got Tasmania going. Local historian Gwen Hardstaff knows all about the power of hydro. She lived and worked here with her family in the late 50s. So what's this? Well, this is the main turbine room. It is, it's the heart of the whole Great Lakes scheme, the original power station. Long before the Snowy River scheme, this station, now a museum, harnessed the power of the lake country and transformed Tasmania forever. So why did they pick here? Well, we had the huge natural resource of the Great Lake with all that water there the beautiful valley down here and the natural incline down and perfect spot for this project. And it was recognised by people who had the ingenuity to carry it through. The Hydroelectric Commission built a village for its permanent workers nearby on the Ouse River. What was it like living here? It was a wonderful place to live. It was a great place for bringing up children because they all learned to ride bikes here and the swimming pool was here. The a school. swimming pool? Yes, we had a heated swimming pool. Or it's almost a country club existence it was <laughs> here. Everything was free. Tennis court, you can see down there. There were picture shows a couple of times a week. The original power station at Watamana was eventually decommissioned. And in 1971, Gwen and her family said goodbye to their idyllic village life. It's just such a, a lovely place to come back to and to reminisce. It's a very special place in a special area of Tasmania. When we visited, most of the houses were empty and part of the town was up for sale. While the village's future may be uncertain, its past will be cherished forever. And even though Watamana's days as a power station are over, hydro's still a big part of what fuels Tasmania. All the Highlanders I've met so far seem keen to look after their wild home, but the owners of my next destination are not only reviving the land, 
they're also enriching their culture. Well, Lisa, yeah, from Lingana, Trautamakaminya. Welcome to Trautamakaminya. Thank you very much. Tell me a little bit about this place. Well, this place is an amazing bit of country with so many layers of history and culture. For thousands of years, this was home for the big river people who camped here, uh, lived here, hunted here. And at the moment, it's now Aboriginal land. You bought it? Yeah, the property was purchased by, uh, with Commonwealth assistance and through private donation. The nearly 7,000 hectares of largely pristine wilderness is the largest parcel of land ever bought for Aboriginal people in Tasmania. Must mean a lot to you to be back on this land. Yeah, well, it's just wonderful that Aboriginal people can build land estate again after so long of having land taken away in dispossession. It is so important that the Aboriginal community can rebuild connections and rebuild culture and knowledge that really can only be got from, from land. Now the property is a sanctuary for Aboriginal people from all over the state. They stay and hunt and take part in cultural workshops. We have a ranger team who works here to look after the property. We take care of the fences and do a bit of weed control, a bit of fire management. It's part of the central highlands. It seems like quite a special environment here. Yeah, well, it is unique here. And so where we are here now, it's a bit higher and it has its own character. We have species like cider gums that live up here only in these higher parts. Okay, this is our little cider gum baby. This is about four years old, this little tree. And these cider gums are a really important part of the cultural landscape up in this area. So these trees, traditionally, our ancestors would tap the tree and get the sap out, and have a nice drink of the sap. What does it taste like? Cider? Well, it's really, they call it cider gum. It actually does have, have oh, a bit really? of a cidery flavour. Without the alcohol? With, well, it does have alcohol if you let it ferment, which they did do at times. Wow. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, though, they're a tree that's really under a lot of pressure. They're very susceptible to being eaten by wild animals and by livestock, and also land clearance and climate change. When does it get to be an adult cider gum? <laughs> Well, it's got a few years ahead of it left, and let's hope it, it can survive. I mean, they can live hundreds of years, so let's hope that we can, we can make that happen. There's a compelling story unfolding here. Andre and his team are writing a new chapter for their people and this precious part of the plateau. Forest cake and I'll make the spots. Okay. Who's in charge here? Tony is, because I don't cook fast enough. <laughs> She's too slow. Linda, what do you say to that? I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm <just> speechless. <laughs> so the two of you get on in the kitchen. I oh, guess. Yes. As long as she's not in it. <laughs> So what's all this for? This is for the Christmas party that we're having here, the community centre Christmas party. Tony and Linda are the faces behind Maina's community centre. Always cook with grog. Sometimes I put it in the food. <laughs> so what's the community like up here? They're mainly elderly. I think the statistics are about 80% live on welfare payments. Up here, yeah. So it's, yeah, we're pretty poor. But we're rich in people. It's Everybody's just... welcome. It doesn't yeah. matter what your background is or whatever. Just walk through the door and you'll always be welcome. How much do the two of you rely on each other? Oh, heaps. We Not that she'll probably that agree to it, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, both our husbands have got health issues and um, we just support each other. We can come over here if we're having a bad day at home. <laughs> Tony, what would life be like without Linda? 
pretty lonely. Mm. It doesn't matter what we say to each other, we neither one of us take offence to it. Yeah. She means a lot. <laughs> oh, you could stop crying. <laughs> and I've only got a couple of baubles left. While they're busy putting the finishing touches to this tree for the party, I'm going to duck out and say goodbye to another very special tree. There's something about the Myena cider gums that remind me of the people up here. They're fringe dwellers, not unlike the shack communities. They're also hardy, like the Highlanders, but fragile. From what I've seen and heard, there's a lot of hope and determination to not only save the Myena cider gum in this incredible wilderness, but also the communities who've carved out their existence here in the wild heart of Tassie. What we've created at the Hall has kept me here and will keep me in the future to try and just make contact with those who are lonely and to try and make their lives a little better. I'm going to start on a chocolate wheel. If you want to check it, just put your hand up and I know where to go. You get a couple of good days fishing and the whole world changes, revitalises me, keeps me going. Number 18, one eight. It's very wild land. Yeah, very wild. It's part of our hearts and always will be. <laughs> Next time, Back Rose takes a trip through the heart of Victoria's Mallee to discover the town that built an oasis. We've actually nailed that. <laughs> <laughs> the mother of all Mallee roots. There was none compared in size to this one. And the place where the earth meets the sky. It's a pretty powerful thing knowing that your old people walked on this same ground that we're sitting on now.